Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Thank you, Roger. My name's John. I got it. <laughs> I got it, too. And I got it in all the ways he just told you about. With the pills, with the tranquilizers, the sedatives, the stimulants, and the narcotics. I never shot any heroin, but I never had to. I could always get something better. We were talking up here a minute ago about... He said, asked me if I... Uh, if most of my patients knew that I was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I told him, yes, I thought so. And I got to thinking, though, after I told him that, about one man that came to see me about two or three years ago. Said he wanted to talk to me. He lived out in the lower edge of the county there, Bullock County where I live. And he says, John, he says, where are you going on these weekends when you go out of town? I said, I'm going to AA meetings. He says, you ain't getting drunk? He says, that's the way you used to do. do. You know, you used to leave on Friday and come back on Monday. And said, you've always had a hangover. He said, you're not getting drunk? I said, no, I'm staying sober. Said, that's the way I stay sober. He said, well, some Sunday afternoon when you haven't got anything to do, will you ride down through my end of the county and let these people down there see you? Because they all think you're still drunk. <laughs> So there are a few of them that don't know I'm in AA, Roger, and I want them to find it out. I, 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 I took him seriously on that, and I've met some of those people. I belong to a member of the Statesboro, Georgia, 12-step group. Somebody said that was a good group because it had a good sobriety record. They said that most of our members are sober all the time, some are sober the most of the time, and all are sober some of the time. <laughs> And uh, I'm very happy to be with you. It's a real privilege to be here. I met many of you at Brownwood and some of you at Shreveport. And I am sold on Texas. I really, this is our first trip here last September when we came to Brownwood. And it's really been a wonderful experience for Dot and me. And I'm very happy that she could come with me and I just fallen in love with every one of you. We want to keep coming back if we can. I don't have a lot to tell. I'm an alcoholic. And uh, I'm... Uh, I'm one of these, uh, these guys that, that had to, had to go all the way down to the bottom. I wasn't like some of those who begin to see the danger signs ahead and are able to look at themselves and then get sober without having to go that far. I had to go right on down until there wasn't any question in anybody's mind, including mine, that I was an alcoholic and that I was whipped and I could not drink or take any kind of pills. I, became convinced that I couldn't take any medication at all. And so as a result, since I have been in AA, I haven't taken even an aspirin tablet. And I used to make a big to-do about that in my AA talk. And one night a fellow came up to see me after the meeting, and he was drunk. And he says, Doc, you sure have helped me. He says, I'm still drinking a little liquor, but I ain't taking no aspirin. Ah! <laughs> 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 I was an operator when I was drinking. I guess when I, uh, I've always been sort of two people. Uh, I was the person that I was, and then I was the person I dreamed to be someday. My father uh, was a rather prominent uh, country physician there, and he was uh, himself a country doctor held in considerable esteem there in our area. But he mingled with some of the great. He was a friend of the Mayos, and he was a student of Sir William Osler. And I used to think about myself as sometimes being great, just like these, uh, just like uh, these people that I had met when I was a very young boy that he took me to and introduced me to. And I, I had this feeling of all these great things that I was going to do someday, and then faced with the fact and the things that I could do at the time. The things that I, were, I was going to do were tremendous. The things that I did do were rather mediocre. 
And I finally made it to Emory University, still sober, never had a drink. And one night, shortly after my, uh, I guess it was my 17th birthday, just about a week afterward, I took a drink of corn whiskey one night at a dance. And I became all these things that I had dreamed of being. I became great. <laughs> From then on, when I was drinking, I was the great Mooney. And when anybody uh, told me anything that made me feel like uh, this liquor did help me, I clung to it. One girl told me one time, says, John, you're so cute. When you're drinking, you ought to drink all the time. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> what, <laughs> what more could you want? <laughs> I got to be an operator, and I had dreams, and I'm reminded of another story about this. These two fellas were in partnership, and one of them was down in Florida on a trip, and he came up uh, uh, on this big motel, and he had a few drinks in the bar, and he came out, and he got to looking at it, and he saw this tremendous complex. Oh, it was cabanas and rooms and swimming pools and golf courses and a half a mile of beach and everything in the world you want. And so he casually asked the managers, he says, what do you want for this hotel? The fellow said, $17 million. He says, gosh, that's a bargain. This thing's worth $20 million. So he called up his friend in New York and said, I've got a real bargain here where we can really go into business. And $17 million, and he described it for him. And his partner said, maybe you can get it a little cheaper. See if you can get him down to $14.5 million. So he went back and he talked to him, and he called his friend up later, and he said, well, I talked to the owner and said, we got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that he will sell us this thing for $14.5 million, but the bad news is he wants $500 cash. <laughs> 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 I lived in a world of ideas and plans, and none of them ever came through. But alcoholism wasn't too bad with me to start with, I guess, because I did manage to struggle through college and through medical school. I look back now, and I see one thing that happened that should not have happened, I guess. It would not if I hadn't been drinking. My scholarship dropped off, and I still graduated all right, but I wasn't doing the work in my books that I was when I started. I got married. Incidentally, uh, there's a coincidence in my career here. I guess uh, one of the things that I was striving for was that little MD to put after my name so I could be Dr. Mooney. You know, this puts you a little above every, the common herd, you know, and I valued this very much, and I wanted to be Dr. Mooney, and so I got it. And I got it on June the 10th, 1935. That's the day they handed me to my diploma, and that's the date on my diploma. And if those of you who have read your book, you know, A Comes of Age, will know that that was the day that they carried the message to the third member, Bill, in the hospital. June the 10th, 1935. We followed different paths from that time on. But this fellowship of AA was born on the very day when I really went in to some of my serious drinking. Because I felt like, you know, that if I had this M.D., that I had it made then, that things could go. I got married, as I said, shortly after that, a few months, and I married a young society girl from Atlanta, real nice person. She uh, had a good name, the kind of gal that you think would uh, uh, you'd like to have for a distinguished doctor like I was going to be, and uh, we uh, got along pretty good. Even then, alcohol was causing me some trouble because one night, I remember I got drunk when I didn't mean to. I had to exercise control over my drinking from the beginning. The very first night I got drunk, that I drank, I got drunk. They poured me into bed that night. And I know now that I was an alcoholic from the very beginning, the first drink. But I was able to control it. And to me, alcoholism through most of its extent is controlled drinking. I think that when a person reaches the point that he loses control over his drinking, that he is in the terminal stage of alcoholism, and he can die at any time, as I could have. It was only a merciful God that kept me alive in those later years when I could not control the amount that I took. My course of alcoholism, the course in me, was a gradual loss of control. And this is one of the nights, not long after I got married, that I lost control. We were going to have a party, and I was going to have some drinks and have some fun with everybody, and uh, I started off that way, and something happened. And I woke up, and it was the next morning, and I was in the baby crib. I wasn't in the bed at all. And I didn't have any clothes on. 
and the baby crib was out in the hall. <laughs> and I was humiliated, humiliated, I think, you know, I'm sorry, I, was I was humiliated. I charged it off as just a little incident, you know, got a little too much and all that, but this thing stuck with me, and I had to keep charging it off because it uh, kept coming up in my mind, and I would have to continue to explain it away, you know. These things have a habit of doing that. We have to explain some of these things over and over again to ourselves. I did this many times. Never completely satisfied with the answer. I knew it was trouble and wouldn't admit it. I went off to the war. I came back. I had a real bad problem during drinking. I mean, drinking during the war. I got restricted to camp, which is bad for an officer, for my drinking. I came back and something had happened to my home. My wife had undergone some type of character degeneration. She was no longer the little girl that was going to make the ideal doctor's wife. She had developed all types of neuroses. She had become to cling to her mother's uh, apron string. She was on the telephone calling her all the time, and they were talking about my drinking, which, of course, wasn't very bad. I had a bad case of war nerves, you know, and I was drinking a little because of that, but I couldn't see how they could possibly have uh, blamed all these things they talk about on me, how it could be true. And uh, I beat her up a few times, and it didn't help her at all. <laughs> she went back to Atlanta, we got a divorce, and I haven't seen her since. Of course, those of you who may not know what the, the way the alcoholic mind works, I was seeing in her my own character defects. This was projection, and there was nothing whatsoever wrong with her. It was just the fact that alcoholism was getting worse in me, and I was beginning to see the the, the fault in other people, the trouble around me, and blaming my drinking on this fancied trouble that was there. Begin to have resentments. I'm reminded of another story there about resentments. You may have heard this, but it's too good not to tell because it explains to me so much what a resentment is. This fellow was driving down the road one night about midnight, and his car broke down. He had a flat tire, rather. And he got out to get his jacket. He didn't have one. So he looked down the road about a quarter of a mile, and uh, he saw a light on in a house. And so he walked down the road to this house, and he began to think. He said, I'll go down and ask this man if he'll lend me a jacket. But as he, wrote down, as he walked down the road, he got to thinking. He said, now, it's real late at night, and this fellow's probably already undressed and ready to go to bed. And uh, it's cold out there. He's not going to want to get up and go. And this Jack is probably out in his car somewhere, and he, maybe he'll have to look up the key to the car, or even he'll have to go open the barn. And he got a little word. I know he's not going to want to do this. And he began to get real disturbed about the way this fellow was going to react. And finally, when he walked up the steps of the house, the light went off. And he says, well. So the fellow knocked. So he knocked on the door, and the fellow threw up the window. He looked out and says, Hello, what can I do for you? He says, you can keep your damn jack. <laughs> Very early in my drinking, I got, I developed something that I hear everybody talk about, and I've heard it over and over and over, and I know, I know it was with me worse than it was with anybody else, and so bad that it's still with me, and that's this business of personal honesty, of lying to myself about things. I find myself doing it all the time, you know, even now, after six and a half years in this fellowship, I'll get up in the morning and Dot will say, where are you going? I say, I'm going to the hospital. Well, not at all. I'm going to the office. I have to go back and tell her, no, I'm going to the office. I just lie automatically without doing it. I have to watch it. There was a young girl one time. She was married, and she was applying for a divorce. And she went before the judge, and the judge said, Susie, on what grounds do you want this divorce? And Susie says, Judge, I want this divorce on the grounds of infidelity. My husband has been unfaithful to me. He says, Susie, in what way has your husband been unfaithful to you? She says, Judge, I don't think he's the father of my child. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. I could blame anything that happened to me on somebody else. 
And I began to do this. I did it back then after the war when my first wife left me very shortly. Uh, I noticed, though, that after she left, I was drinking more than ever. I got really drunk after that until I met Dot, and she set out to straighten me out. She she finally did, you know, but it took her a long time. <laughs> and we've been together ever since. We got married. Now, I don't know when it was. If you can keep up with the dates in your alcoholic history, you're better than I am, because to me there are many, many phases of this thing in which it was it's vague. I don't know when I started doing certain things and all, but I do know certain principles I have. And I don't like drunk doctors. And I don't like drunk doctors treating me. And I, <laughs> and I don't like uh, to treat patients drunk. And it's this, uh, it, uh, the few times when I had to do this, it, it also humiliated me, Bob. I didn't like to do it. And a doctor always has a way to conceal this thing. And I began to look down in my little black bag and I came up with some pills. I would go off for the weekend, I'd have to go back to work on Monday or Tuesday, and I would need something real badly, and I didn't want to drink, I felt the, the need of the drink, I had to have it, but I didn't take it because I had a substitute. And the drug that I chose that suited me the best for this purpose was codeine. I could take two or three codeine tablets, and my hangover symptoms would leave me, I would get back up on this little cloud that I like to be on. I spent most of my life on some sort of a cloud, chemical cloud, and I would get uh, on this thing. Then I could carry on. You couldn't smell it. And I looked pretty good, I guess, you know, not, not too bad anyway. And I carried on with it. When you take a drug of any type, I want to tell you one thing about drugs is there's no such thing as a drug which does not have a side effect. They all do. When you take a drug of any type, you're going to find that drug is going to do something to you that you didn't want it to do, something besides what it's supposed to do. This codeine relieved my symptoms of a hangover perfectly, but it made me nauseated after I got a pretty good dose built up. It would make me sick, and this annoyed me. So I began to take a little preparation called bromunil and barbital. It's put up like salopatic disorder by Upjohn, and it fizzes, and you drink it, see, while it's fizzing and it's the bromide antibarbiturate, and it will stop your nausea beautifully. It works real well. And so it would stop the nausea. But it would make me sleepy. <laughs> so <laughs> I took Benzedrine to wake me up. <clears throat> and this would make me jittery and nervous, so I would take Nimbutal to calm me down. And I got on what I uh, call, I guess, a, a balanced life. I had to keep this thing in perfect balance or I was going to fall flat on my feet or go out through the ceiling or something. And... It's real difficult. If you don't think, uh, uh, you, if you don't know what a busy life is, you ought to try this thing because you really have to watch it every minute. You have to keep these drugs going in at exactly the right amount so you'll get in trouble. And I occasionally got in trouble from it, but mostly I coasted along with it and I was able to eliminate the alcohol from this routine. I went on these pills. I went on these uh, stimulants with this uh, mild narcotic in there for I don't know how long, but I didn't drink. It broke up the compulsive pattern of drinking, you know. Enough tranquilizers will do this. If you're taking enough Librium or enough Equinil or something like this, you might not even want to drink, even if you're an alcoholic. And I could take a can of beer, take half of it, and throw the rest of it away. So how was I to believe I had an alcohol problem when I could sip or leave it alone? And I really didn't pay much attention to my alcohol during this, pro this period of my life. But I kept adding other drugs to it. And I kept taking things out of my sample cabinet, trying to get some type of relief from nervousness and tension and these terrible feelings I used to have. Until finally one night I took so much of this stuff, I had a convulsion. This was a critical point in my life, I think, because I think it's one time when I realized there was something real bad wrong with me, that people just don't have convulsions out of the clear. And I knew how much I was taking. I wound up in a psychiatric hospital, and I was uh, concerned about myself, and I began to see, try to see what was wrong. I stayed in this place about two months. I found out a lot about my personality. I found out I was escaping, that I had a lot of things wrong, and that this is why I was having to take these things, was because I had all these things wrong with me. This is what I believed. This is what they call the psychiatric approach to this problem, that you are nervous and disturbed, have a psychoneurosis or something like that, and 
We drink to escape, see. We drink because of these symptoms. We take pills because of these symptoms. My logical uh, thinking, conclusion from this thing was that if I get this emotional disturbance straightened out, I won't have to drink so much, see. And I worked on that for years and years and years, hoping I could find the doctor, the psychiatrist, or somebody who would relieve all this tension and anxiety in me, show me what was wrong, so I wouldn't need to use these things in excess. See? And uh, I never found him. I never found him because I'm an alcoholic, because I wasn't willing to see the alcohol problem in this, and because for alcoholics it don't do any good to settle your emotions, to straighten them out or resolve it. I finally had to learn from you people that the cure from alcoholism is to stop drinking. <laughs> I really didn't know that until I came to AA, I don't think. <clears throat> I was always <clears throat> trying to find out some way where I could drink successfully, you know, without drinking to excess. I went to this first psychiatric hospital. I got out and I came back. And because I did not consider the drugs or the alcohol as the cause of the condition, I continued to drink over and over again. I went in and out of places. I would get on alcohol and I would get on pills and then try to get back, try to get off the pills and then get back on the alcohol to get off the pills on this merry-go-round, always having to go back to a hospital in order to get off of any of them. This was a, a, a terrible period in my life because I was struggling so hard to carry on in the face of, of, of a lot of trouble, in the face of feeling bad all the time, kept trying to find a drug that would make me feel better, having confidence that somewhere there was a doctor or a drug that could restore me to some semblance of normal and yet failing completely. I wound up in another psychiatric hospital in 1953. Here was a milestone in my life because I handed, had handed to me on a silver platter this wonderful fellowship. I was up there in New Canaan, Connecticut at a place called Silver Hill, a very fancy place. It cost a lot of money. We borrowed the money and to send me up there. I had gone up there in style in an ambulance with a private nurse. You know, you've got to travel first class. <laughs> and I had gone in this place, and they were working with me. They were trying to get my thinking straightened out. They gave me all kind of tests of one sort or another. But among the things he did was to hand me this book. Now, I don't know what he told me when he handed me this book, but I read it. And I said, this is one of the, one of the most beautiful things I've ever read. Oh, it's a wonderful thing for the alcoholic. And boy, I'm going back and get all my alcoholics to read this book and do something about their problem. There are stories in that book that were taken out of my hip pocket, just like Roger said. And I know, I know that there was something wrong with my mind that I was not able to see this. You know, it's a, it's an amazing thing, this mind. I had it come hit me the other day with a, with a fella. This guy had been coming around AA for Oh, six or eight, ten years. And he hadn't been able to get sober. And the other day I saw him and he was sober. And I said, uh, boy, how you getting along? You're doing real good. You look good. Yeah. He said, I found out what was wrong. He said, I went to a fella and he said, you know what he told me? He told me to do it one day at a time. <laughs> how many thousands of times had he been told that? But only the last time did he hear it. How many times was I told over and over again what was wrong? There it was in the book. There they were telling me about it, but the mind was closed, the ears were stopped up, I could not hear it, and so I didn't, and I forgot. I came on back, and I went my merry way, in and out of hospital, still fighting, 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 trying to carry on, and then one day, I guess it must have been 57 or 58, when things were getting pretty rough with me, AA came to me again. I was sitting in my living room one Saturday afternoon, watching the test pattern on television, I reckon, <laughs> and uh, my wife and the children had all gone out in the country, and I was there alone, and this man named Henry came in, and Henry said, John, I want to talk to you. This was in Statesboro, my home there, and he sat down and he told me a story of his recovery from alcoholism, and I was absolutely amazed. You know, Henry was one of the worst drunks I'd ever known, and I'd seen that poor fellow just throw his life away, and I'd wanted to help him so bad. I didn't know what to do for him, and here he was telling me of a wonderful story of recovery in AA and how he was sober now and how well he was doing. And I was just overwhelmed with what the AA Fellowship had done for Henry, and I fell 
oh, I fell for AA. I thought it was wonderful. And I said, uh, Henry says, John, would you like to come to a meeting? I said, yes, sir, I sure will, Henry. You set the meeting up, and I'll go tell you fellows about alcoholism anytime you want me to. <laughs> How stupid can you get, see? A 12-step call, and Henry's story is like mine, too, see? And I used to get drunk with Henry, and Henry ain't been near as much trouble as I've been in, and yet I wasn't able to see it. Twice. Something wrong, something, some valve in my mind that was not open, some switch that was open when it should have been closed. I don't know what it was, but I didn't see it for myself at all. So I had to go down. Each time I got in trouble and each time these, both these times that uh, AA came to me, I was a little further down the ladder, a little closer to whatever a bottom is. I believe a bottom is wherever you are at the moment. <laughs> Everybody in here is on a bottom. Right now, everybody in here, in more ways than one. <laughs> the only, if we want a lower bottom, we all go out and drink some more, see? But if we don't want a lower bottom, we can stop right where we are. And I, that was true for a long time with me. I could have stopped any time. Any time that AA came to me, I could have stopped and come in, and that would have been my bottom as far as drinking if I hadn't drunk anymore. But I wasn't satisfied with it. Sometimes the bottom, uh, the depth of the bottom is, is direct. Uh, is inversely proportional to the intelligence. The more stupid you are, the deeper bottom it takes. <laughs> Does that make sense, Bob? <laughs> well, anyway, I must have been real stupid because I did not get any of this thing for myself. In 1959, I think, was a critical time in my life. I was sick. I was bad on narcotics taking Demerol mostly. I was having to run to get them. The drugstores had had a little meeting, and all six owners had come to my office and told me they weren't going to let me have any more narcotics. I still had my narcotic stamp, and I could write prescriptions. I had my license. And I was traveling over the country to other towns, writing prescriptions to fictitious people in order to get something for myself, doing this over and over again, every day, as a matter of fact, because each day... I bought enough supply to last me another day because, see, tomorrow I was going to quit. I'm going to taper off on this one, and then I'm going to stop. And I never got more than just enough to carry me to tomorrow when I was going to make this thing stop, where I was going to cut down the dosage, and then the dosage would be, the bottle would be half empty before I got home. I, I think I had a change in me because I think now is a time, 59, when I had a real desire for something better. I don't think I had a desire to stop drinking, to stop taking dope. I knew that I was in trouble with everything that I took, whether it was narcotics, uh, pills, or liquor, and I wanted out. I wanted out. I think this is what God had been waiting for. I think that, uh, that he'd been waiting for me to reach this point of desire, because I think the things that happened to me after that fall into a perfect pattern. Had any one of them failed to happen, I wouldn't be here tonight, I don't think. It had to be done. The first thing that had to happen to me because of my stupidity, my pride, this conviction I could do this thing myself if I tried had it hard enough, this thing had to be bad. Something had to happen to cut me down to size. I think that's the word it uses in the big book. I had to be cut down to what I am. See, I thought I was something special. I was drunk one time. And the preacher had talked to Dot, and he'd fix things up in home, and had me in a hospital over in Fort Valley, Georgia, after I'd been drunk all over Alabama and New York and everywhere, and finally come back there. And he had sobered me up, <clears throat> arranged for me to get sober in the hospital, and he'd come to get me. And he was riding down the road, and he says, John, you know what's the matter with you? You think you're something special. You think you're something special. You think you've got special talents and special abilities other people have to have. He says, what you've got to know is, what you've got to realize is, that you ain't nobody but plain old John Mooney. I said, preacher, I'd like to believe you, but it's just not true. <laughs> <laughs> he knew I was going to drink some more, see, and I did. This is the kind of pride I had. And if something hadn't happened, it has to happen when a guy gets like this. The Lord had handed me AA on a silver platter twice, and I had turned my back on it. And uh, I guess he was determined for me to be here. It was, it was his will, and it could not be avoided because I fought it to the bitter end, right up to the bitter end. I knew, though, that I was bad sick. 
And I told Dot I've got to go off and get help. And I know the place to go. I have narcotic addiction. I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I've been going to country clubs. I'm going where I know they know what to do for this uh, disease or trouble or whatever it is I have. I'm going to the U.S. Public Health Service Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. This is a prison. They take prisoners up there and they take volunteers. And I got in a little white Thunderbird, 1956 Thunderbird I had, with the top down. I always went with the top down because I tried to soak up all the sunshine. You know, I was getting sort of pale. And uh, you looked a little better if you get a little blistering uh, sun on you every now and then. So I went around in this uh, Thunderbird. It was white with red upholstery, and I had a little white hat I wore with it. And I uh, guess I wanted to try and be a college boy still, but... But I took off in that thing, and I went to Lexington, and I went in there as a volunteer. Now, I had an idea that they had up there a prison, and they said they also treated volunteers. And I looked at the pictures of the place, beautiful pictures. All prisons look pretty on the outside, and this one was no exception. And I had ideas that they had these prisoners, you know, over here all locked up with bars, and then us uh, volunteers would be maybe in little cottages there off to one side where they wouldn't want us volunteers uh, mingling, you know, with the prisoners. And I went in this place, and they had them all here together in the middle, and they gave me a number, number 55280. And this humiliated me. I think if they had called me Dr. 55280, it wouldn't have been so bad. <laughs> And they put me in there with a bunch of common dope fiends, me, Dr. Mooney, distinguished citizen of Bullock County, in there with a bunch of dope fiends, and I didn't take this thing, see. I told my wife I was going to Penn stay a year. But after a week of being placed with these horrible people in there and beneath my station, you know, <laughs> I was in a mess, I, uh, uh, I signed out, and I signed out against medical advice, and I talked myself to believing that it wasn't the place for me. And this doctor looked me in the eye when I said I was leaving there, and he says, Doc, if you don't stay now while you've got a chance as a volunteer, he said, you'll be back in here within a year on a court order. I said, wait a minute, but <laughs> don't talk like that. And I got out of that quicker, see. I didn't want the people, <laughs> you don't want to be around people that got that opinion of you, you know. So I left. I signed out. And I made a decision that as long as I lived, I would never touch alcohol, I would never touch dope, tranquilizers, sedatives, or anything. This is where I think I came to know that I had an addictive personality, and this means I could get hooked on anything, even empty capsule, if you told me to make me feel better. And I knew this thing, and I was going to leave it off, and I made this decision. And you know, I felt better. I don't know if I was sworn off drinking or not, but I felt much better. And I got my little Thunderbird, and I started home. And I felt that, I don't know, they just I just had a... A feeling as if some weight had been lifted off of me. I felt, oh, it was terrific. And I was riding down the road feeling better for having, knowing that now, from now on, I'm not going to have to drink anymore. I can see this. This, uh, knowing what lies ahead, that I will be in this prison if I keep on, uh, I felt like was enough to convince me that I could stay off of it from now on. I came to a sign. And this sign says, last chance to buy whiskey before Knoxville. Knoxville, Tennessee was dry, and I had to go down U.S. 25 right through it, and I got to think. Now, just because I'm going to quit doesn't mean that everybody else has to quit. Now, I want to spend the night in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, with a friend of mine named Jim, and Jim likes a little toddy. So it seems to me that just to please Jim that I ought to stop and buy a little bit here for Jim. So I bought two-fifths of Canadian Club. <laughs> When I got back in my car, I suddenly recalled that Jim had moved from Gatlinburg, Tennessee, to Greenwood, South Carolina, three years before. I'm stuck with the liquor, so I drive on. My wife may want something. I, you know this business of having your family quit just because we got a problem. This didn't, I didn't want to impose my sobriety on anybody else. I didn't want to insist that anybody around me have to, have to look out for me. See, leave it all out in the open there. Have it around the house where my friends can drink. Well... I said, somebody, I'll run into somebody that wants to drink. Well, I met this fellow when I got to Knoxville. I stopped in a little uh, hamburger stand there, and I ordered a Coke and a hamburger, and I got to thinking. 
You know, you've got to be logical about this thing. Now, anybody who has made a decision to stay sober the rest of his life and never touch this stuff, here he is up here in Tennessee. He's three or four hundred miles from home. Surely he can take one little drink tonight and celebrate one more night before he goes back. So I poured out a drink and I took it. I went to that uh, motel in Gatlinburg. I finally made it. I fell in that bed that night, stupid drunk. I got up the next morning and says, well, it's all over. I'm not going to drink anymore. But I was shaking, so I said, I've got to have one for the road. So I took one and another one. And the next thing I knew, I don't know how many I took, but I woke up in the Gatlinburg jail, with what C.D. calls that striped sunshine coming through the window. <laughs> and uh, I... I don't know how I got there. They tell me I drove my car squarely across the highway and went to sleep. But anyway, I tried to get back to Georgia. You know why I was going back to Georgia? I don't know. They kicked me out of there. They said they couldn't help me. They wanted me to go off and do something for myself. But in trying to drive down U.S. 25 to Statesboro, I got arrested in three states. Now, I knew there couldn't be a conspiracy over the whole southeastern United States to pick me up. I knew I wasn't that important. Pretty important, but not that important, see. And this taught me a lesson, this trip, and I think it, uh, it's been valuable to me. It was necessary. I didn't know it at the time because I was in so much trouble I couldn't think then. But I think some of it got in the back of my head, into my subconscious mind maybe. It stuck there. You see, when I went out of that place, when I went up there, I had a sincere desire to get help. When I came out of there, I had made a sincere and honest desire to stop drinking. It was. And I couldn't do it. I couldn't even last five or six hours, and I knew it. I knew, too, there wasn't anybody but me and that Thunderbird and U.S. 25, and I couldn't go down it back to Georgia without getting in trouble. I realized then, I think, at least later, uh, that people had been taking care of me, had been looking after me, that there had been a shield of people around me standing between me and the consequences of my actions, of my drinking of my dope. Somebody always looking after me. Even when I got in trouble legally with this thing, there were still people there, lawyers and families and friends, who were trying to keep the law from giving me all they could have given me, see, all these people. The people that I thought was the conspiracy that was against me were the folks that were looking after me. And I believe that maybe on this trip is where I began to see this conspiracy for what it really was, a group of people who loved me and wanted to help me, and had been protecting me from myself. And when they weren't there, I was in trouble every minute, practically. I came back. Dot didn't want me. She said, I can't do anything else for you. I went down to Savannah. A doctor there who had looked after me, he didn't want me either. He said, I've done all I can. I finally went to Atlanta, and uh, I, I got up there, and they put me in a hospital, and I panicked. I wanted to drink. They wanted me to stay. And I finally panicked out of this hospital. I was getting in this terrible fear because I couldn't stay anywhere that I wasn't kept. Every time they turned me loose, I'd run somewhere else. They kept trying to give me choices as to what to do, and I wouldn't do it, uh, wouldn't accept it. And I just panicked and went out of this hospital and told them I was going one place and I went another. I got up in the hotel room and I started drinking. And I drank and I drank and I drank. And they, and I was lost and they were trying to find me. They had detectives out because uh, I hadn't gone where they thought I was going. I don't know how much later it was, but they found me. About 2 o'clock in the morning of July the 4th, 1959, and these two men walked in, and they had their hats on. (laughs) It's always the law. (laughs) Everybody else would take their hat off and go in the house except policemen. And uh, they came in, and and they arrested me. And they arrested me on a lunacy warrant because uh, Lord knows I needed it because they were trying to find me before I killed myself, and no question about it. I was drinking drinks that night that I think would have been fatal had I been allowed to drink the rest of that night. When I left that room, I said, can I take a drink before I go? And they said, yes. And I poured out a big drink out of that bottle of Canadian Club, still trying to travel first class, see? And I drank it. And when they set the bottle down, I looked at it to see how much was left in it because I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what happened. But when I came back, whatever it was, I was going to finish that bottle. This was my last drink. I looked for the amount, the level on the bottle, because I always wanted to know if anybody was drinking out of it while I was gone. And uh, I I left there, 
And that was my last drink. And this is a paradox because I have stopped drinking and sworn off a thousand times. Every time I've been in trouble with it, I've sworn this is the last time never again. This was my last drink. And when I took it, I was convinced that I was going to take another one. It was just an interim where I wasn't going to be able to get it for a little while. But before I had a chance to take another drink, I had been incarcerated for nearly five months in a place where they don't serve alcohol. And uh, I had joined Alcoholics Anonymous, and they told me, you don't have to quit drinking. You just don't take that first drink today. So the one time I didn't quit, I've been able to stay sober. I came back, and I was in bad trouble, real bad trouble. They had picked up some of my prescriptions, see. See, I, I used to pull a real fast deal there. I'd go into some little town where I had a friend. And I would go by and see this friend and tell him, try to pick somebody live close to a drugstore, work close to a drugstore, and I'd go see him, and we'd chat a while, and I'd say, let's go in the drugstore and get a Coke. And so we'd go in and get a Coke. And then while he was talking, I'd say, oh, by the way, Bill, I'm down here to see an old lady out here in the country, and I need to get a medication that uh, I can get, but the druggist needs to know who I am and identify me. So he says, sure, and so he'd take me back, hey, this is good old John, boy, I've been knowing him all my life, fine doctor. He's like, yes, sir, and so I'd write a prescription out to a fictitious individual, give me some Demerol, sign my name to it, pay for it, and walk on out. Well, you can do this once or twice and get away with it, but when you start hanging this paper all over South Georgia, <laughs> it's going to catch up with you, and they had caught it. And they made a case against me, and they convicted me. They indicted me, as the grand jury did, and they convicted me of a felony. I pled guilty to the illegal possession of one bottle of Demerol because if they had looked for it, they could have found a thousand. And I went before the judge, and I was sentenced to two years. This is a felony. And I was sentenced to two years at the Georgia State Prison in Reedsville, Georgia. And this kindly old man said, John, I don't think you're a criminal. I think you're sick. And I'm going to probate this sentence, providing you'll go back to Lexington, and you'll stay there until they release you. So I went back to Lexington. And it wasn't a year, it was two weeks <laughs> from the time this doctor told me that I would be back within a year, see. And I didn't go in my Thunderbird, I went in an airplane with a deputy sheriff. And he put me out the gate. See, they can keep only federal prisoners in there, technical prisoners. But uh, they put me out at the gate and told me that if I tried to leave, that they would meet me at the gate and I would be carried back to Reedsville State Prison and I would be... Uh, serve the rest of my time there, be incarcerated there for the rest of that two years. Well, there ain't a lot, a lot of difference in being a prisoner and being in a situation like that. And this time they had a special term for me. I was a committed volunteer. <laughs> Figure that one out. <laughs> but I went back in there now and I wanted help, you know. I was getting desperate. I knew you, you don't have all this happen to you, see. To stand in your own hometown, well, you've been a successful physician, at least your family has anyway. If I never had, my father had before me, and I'm the fifth in the line of doctors, and I ain't turning out as good as the rest of them, see. And so this was humiliating. It hurt my pride and everything else. But as I see it now, this was a pride that had to go. And it'll do something to your pride when you get convicted of a felony, no question about it. And uh, it hurt felony, no question about it. And uh, it hurt me. And I knew I was in bad, bad trouble. I'd had one chance as a volunteer, and I'd muffed it. If I'd stayed there a week before, I'd have probably got out of this sentence, you know. They probably wouldn't have done anything while I was there because usually they don't. But see, I didn't know that then. I wouldn't have stayed if they had. It had to be forced upon me. I'm the sort of guy you've got to be shown. So I came back in, and I said, I'm going to find a way out of this thing. So I went to my psychiatric friends, and I told them I wanted help. And they gave me three hours of interviews, and they told me I was in one terrible condition that they would not undertake to treat me for the duration of this probated sentence. And they said, on this particular sentence, as long as we can keep you for the cure, is about five months. Unless you will agree to stay for one, two, three years, whatever it takes, we will not start this psychoanalysis. I had a streak of honesty then, I think, because I knew I wouldn't stay. I knew that uh, when my time was up that I had to stay, that I would leave this place and if I left in the middle of psychotherapy, I might be worse off than I was, if possible. So I turned it down. So the psychiatrist said, well, if you won't take our treatment, brother, your next best bet is to go to AA, and you had better go and put your whole heart and soul into that group and into that program. So see, 
I was sent to AA. I was sent to it by the psychiatrist. Not once in all this did I pick this up myself for anything. Now, I had attended a few meetings in there, see, when I first came. I had been going to a few meetings while I was seeing the psychiatrist. But the faith for my cure or recovery or whatever it is they were going to do for me, I was placing in these doctors. And that was taken away from me because I would not accept it on their terms and wanted it on my terms only. They told me to go to AA and I went. God sending me where God knew I had to go but where I couldn't see it myself yet. Another thing happened. They asked me what I wanted to do. Well, I've had a little surgical training. I like to operate. So I applied for a job in the operating room. They give everybody a job up there, see. And so the guy told me, he says, we need somebody to edit the little AA paper in here. And he says, you ought to know how to, how to write a little bit to get through college. And maybe you can get something out for this AA group every now and then that we can use to distribute around to the patients. I kept Hugging away from that. I wanted to get in the operating room. He says, all you'll do in the operating room is mop floors, brother. You better take this. You'll get an office with a typewriter. And that was, that was something. So, so I took it. So they made me go to AA and they made me study AA and all I had to do for that five months, nearly five months, four and a half months I was there was study and work the program of AA. In there they call it Addicts Anonymous because this is primarily a narcotic addiction. And there was a man that came in there, and his name was Houston Sewell. He's dead now. He's died in the last two years. And this was something that got through to me. Mr. Sewell came in there, and he was an old man, and he was retired. And he would come in there, and he would talk to me, and he would talk to these people. And he'd been doing this for 15 years, and he started this group in there. And he came down three times a week during that time, every time he could, that he wasn't sick or something. And he came in there, and he would sit there by the hour. And I was a stranger. He didn't know me. He didn't know these other fellows. He got nothing for it. And I was impressed with the respect they showed to this man. He was the only man that could walk into that, out of that place without being searched that I knew of outside of the employees. The only outsider that had free access to come and go, and he could carry a package of Christmas presents in there, and nobody ever looked in it. And if you knew Lexington... If you knew how much trouble they go to to keep dope from being smuggled into that place where they got about 1,100 narcotic addicts, you would truly see how amazing this is. And I watched Mr. Sewell walk through and out of there just like he was something special, and he was. He was something special. And, and this impressed me, uh, that this man would take this time getting nothing for it and carry this thing into us. And he began to talk to me, and I began to see that there was something he had there that he had found. I worked on the, the thing in AA. I worked on the program. I took the first step uh, and the fourth step and went over and over again on them, memorized the step. I wrote to this little magazine, and I began to, to understand something about the program of AA. But I don't know. I had trouble getting the... Uh, getting the own, my own personality into it, I reckon. I could sit up and discuss the merits of the steps with you by the hour. But when it came right down to how I took the steps, I couldn't tell you. I know now why, because I hadn't really taken them. See? And you can't really tell about it until you do it. But things got through to me there that helped me a great deal. I was uh, sitting in a discussion meeting one night, and somebody asked the question. They said, how... Can I say I'm powerless over narcotics or alcohol when I can't imagine really having any fun without them? They are that important to me. And I says, gosh, I feel the same way. I can't really have fun without this chemical. And to me, that means I am powerless over it. This, uh, this uh, has a, a deeper meaning, I guess an opposite meaning from the way this other fellow saw it. And I began to see that that there's a difference in, uh, in a viewpoint on many things. And uh, I thought about this more and more, just how important it was to me, how important is alcohol to me. And I began to see that I had never been anywhere after I started drinking, that I didn't think a little liquor would have helped it. I used to go to meetings of the Board of Stewards in the church, you know, and we'd sit around and we would, uh, we would talk about the church affairs. And I would say to myself, <laughs> gosh, if we just had a little martini around... We could really get this church business settled. And uh, PTA, 
I would think about the can of beer, either the keg of beer we could put in the back and all the parents were to take a little glass of this beer and a few of them, maybe we could settle this children's uh, business, the school affairs. It, nothing so good that a drink wouldn't have yipped it. This is the way it was, the way it's always been. I went to places where you didn't drink, but there was a certain incompleteness about it. I began to see my alcoholism as a search, you know. Liquor did something for me special, and so did dope, but never quite enough. It was never quite there. I took another drink because I wanted that little thing that was lacking, and the first thing you know, I was in oblivion. I was just like Bob. By the time I reached it, I turned black. It was a, it was a, the, a search with me drinking. I was looking for something in that bottle I couldn't quite get a hold of. And I didn't get a hold of it till I came to Alcoholics Anonymous right here. I stayed in this place and I worked on this program. I took my inventory. I tried to, uh, I tried to, uh, to see myself as I was. And I made, I made one real decision about myself, I think. I began to see that I was in much worse trouble than I thought I was in. I had been skimming on the surface with things and I began to go deeper into my life and into my past and into my trouble. I could see that I was in one hell of a mess and that maybe I didn't have another drunk left in me, that I had gotten in here just in time. I began to see myself as a low, low-bottom drunk. No longer did I look down on the people in there. I saw myself as one of them, and I was a whole lot worse than, than most of them in there. I could see this, too. And then I began to see something else, too. I began to see there wasn't any way out, that every time I had been anywhere, including this place, I had promised myself, when I get out of here, I ain't ever going to drink no more. I'm never going to take anything else. And I always had been unable to keep that promise. I had always drunk again. I've been back on something. There's nothing happened to you now that's going to keep you sober. And as sure as you get out of here, you're going to drink. And as sure as you drink, you're going to die. And this is a terrible dilemma. I know now what I was doing. I was really getting into this first step in a serious way. And I don't think I could have stayed sober if I had any reservations about this first step. I don't think I've had any yet. I've never heard you say anything about an experiment in AA that I ain't tried with that first step, see. And my inventory showed me this. I've, I've tried all the ways I know of to drink. I've tried all the mixtures of drugs to, 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 to help this thing. And I've always been flat on my back but flat on my face in the end. So I don't have to experiment anymore. The things that happened to me, I have gratitude for because they enable me to take this first step without reservation, I believe, as I stand here tonight. But you know, the first step leaves you in a pretty, pretty sorry mess, because if you realize you can't quit drinking, and then if, and then if you drink, you're going to die, there isn't much to live for. But God never lets us down. He didn't let me down. This same Houston soil arranged with the director of the hospital to take two of us to an outside meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous at the Token Club in Lexington, Kentucky. Some of you may have been there on a Tuesday night. And we went out to this meeting, and this was my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You see, I'd been in an institution. In an institution, you don't, you don't work AA the same way you do out here. There are many, many things you do in an institution that help. It gave me background. It helped me take this fourth step, this first step. It gave me a lot of associations there. It did a lot for me, but you don't have to stay sober in their institution on the AA program. They'll keep you sober on your own by just not giving you anything to drink, see. They don't have any liquor stores in prisons. And, and I was using AA for everything except what people outside were using it for. I went that night to a group of people who were using AA for nothing except staying sober. I don't mean that really. I'm using it first of all to stay sober because they're using it for a lot of other things, but first of all to stay sober. And uh, I was impressed. I had never seen anything just like this before. I mean, these people were happy. They're just like you are here tonight. They were laughing. And uh, my first impression was they're on something. You don't feel this way unless you're taking something. And, you know, this is a... <laughs> This is a common experience for people going to AA for the first time and seeing the people there. Surely they got something that makes them feel this way. And it wasn't long, though, before I knew that this wasn't true. I knew these people had something, and they told me they knew I could do it. And they looked me in the eye and said that. And I didn't know I could do it myself until they said so. 
They didn't say they knew I would. They said they knew I could. And I went out of that meeting that night with hope that somewhere in this program there was something for me that could keep me sober. I didn't know where it was. Because Alcoholics Anonymous, the program of AA, the, the grace of God that keeps you sober, is not something you read in a book. It's something you experience. And I had not yet experienced. I came out of there, and I left three days later. And I caught a plane to go to Statesboro, Savannah Airport, and my wife was going to meet me there. I went out of there very much disturbed. I hadn't slept any in two or three nights. I still uh, couldn't couldn't bring myself to believe uh, that I could stay sober, and yet I knew I had to, and I knew, too, that I had to go back to Statesboro and walk the streets of Statesboro sober. I couldn't walk the streets of any town sober. I had to go back there. I got on the plane in Lexington, and when I got to Atlanta, and I had to change planes at the Atlanta airport, I was unable to physically walk up the steps of that airplane to go to Savannah. This threw me into a panic because I had never had anything like this happen before. I didn't know what was wrong. I know now what was wrong. I know that this idea of having to go down and prove to the people of Statesboro that I could stay sober is a matter of pride. Pride is the only thing that has to prove anything, you see. And I had to, I had to go show them. It was pride making me do it, and there wasn't enough pride left to get me on that plane down. See, I'm not afraid of airplanes, I don't think. I used to be a paratrooper in the war, and I've jumped out of them many times. But that night, I couldn't get on that one. And I wound up in a motel as miserable and helpless and hopeless as I have ever been. I went over my life, and I said, now, here's what you've been working for. You've been staying up here in this place. You've been going to AA. You've been trying to find a way to deal with it. And now you want to go down there and do it, and you can't do it. And this, uh, if you ever get in a situation where there's something you've got to do physically, and you can't do it, and yet there's no reason, obvious reason why you can't, this is disturbing because this is a loss of physical control and it was real bad on me. I went back in that motel room. I got to thinking. I got to, I got out on my knees finally when I had nowhere else to turn and I asked God to help me. I don't think I had any faith. I don't think I had any hope that God would. But I think I had something that night that I've never had before and I know darn well I've never had it since. I think I had humility. I think I had reached the point of surrender where this pride, this do-it-yourself, this shell had been stripped away from me and there wasn't nothing but the naked me left there and it was so miserable, so helpless, so hopeless that I didn't want to live with it. I had an instant experience, as I believe it was, an instant feeling of the presence of God. The, the, the characteristic of this whole thing was fear, was terror, because I, I knew something bad was going to happen, and suddenly all this terror, this terror leaves, and I'm no longer afraid. And suddenly I know the meaning of the third step. I know the meaning of making the decision to turn your will and your life over to the care of God, and I made this decision right then. And I think this is when I took that first step, as it, the third step as it was. And I knew then that I could not do this myself, but God could and would if I would let him. God had to use some pretty drastic things to get to me. I couldn't have gotten it gradually. I think in my stupidity, this terrible pride, this do-it-yourself, this refusal to admit defeat in the face of all evidence that I was whipped and completely whipped, I think it's the thing that kept him from getting to me any other way, and he had to do it this way. I had to be literally knocked flat on my back. I slept like a baby that night, and I got up the next morning, and I caught that plane, and all this terror, this fear had gone. I knew now that this unanswerable problem of how to stay sober, that God would do for me if I would let him. That I could stay sober if I could turn my will in my life over to the care of God and let him do it. That I could not take the responsibility for my own sobriety. That I had to try to stay away from the first drink and then stay with the people who knew how to stay sober, to stay with God. I had this feeling about it. I don't think the fellowship of AA got through to me too well by that time because I had another narrow escape. I came on down there and Dot met me. I had this wonderful feeling of release from all this fear and tension. We came on back. I got uh, my office nurse. We opened up practice and I told them and my friends of this experience I had had with God, that God had come into my life and that I had this feeling that 
that I had been defending myself against God. He'd been trying to get into me for a long time, but because of his pride, I wouldn't let him. And now he was there. And what does the Bible say? You can do all things through Christ who's strengthening us. And I, I, uh, I believe this. So whatever these good things are we're going to do, we can do them now because God's going to help me do it. Now, there ain't nothing wrong with this attitude if you're not a drunk like I am, see. There's nothing wrong with the interpretation of the Scripture that you can do anything through Christ unless you're an alcoholic like I am, see. But there's plenty wrong with it if you react the way I do, see. Because I came down there, and I had had this spiritual experience, and I was going to go ahead and, and reestablish my good name, build my practice, be a good husband, good father, upstanding citizen, stay sober through the strength of God, see, in my life. It's the only way it can be done. But it's got to be done some other way than the, by the way that I was going to do it. I stayed there two weeks getting started on this program of, uh, of getting my practice rebuilt again, nearly two weeks. My sponsor had told me up at Lexington that he went to five or six AA meetings a week. And I remember my reaction. This was shortly before I left. Isn't it wonderful, this grand old man? can go to all that AA. When I get back down there, if I wasn't such a busy doctor, I'd be able to do this too, you know. But I'm going to go to all the AA that I can while I'm there, uh, that my practice will let me go. But I'm in debt. I'm going to have to work real hard, and you're not going to be able to make these five or six meetings a week, you know, if you're going to work hard to get to feed your family. Noble purpose is feeding your family. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm for it. I was down there about ten days or two weeks. And I was getting back in business. And I hadn't got around to calling AA. Hey, see, I'm a, I'm a big shot AA up here. It's just sort of me and God carrying along this thing on ourselves. And I guess maybe with a spiritual experience, you might decide sometime, you know, we're not going to need those drunks. We just get along all right with, with, with God here. I don't know what my reaction was, but I hadn't called AA. I hadn't done a thing. And I got a message to go to Atlanta. And I went up there, and the State Board of Medical Examiners in Atlanta, Georgia, says, Dr. Mooney. You have been convicted of a felony. You cannot practice medicine in this state with that on your record, and they promptly relieved me of my license to practice medicine. The word they use is revoke, and that is a very foul <laughs> word if you look it up in the dictionary. <laughs> and they took it away along with my narcotic stamp and everything else. And I went back down there with nothing to do, see except go to AA. Now, I've been there two weeks, and I haven't called AA at all. I got on the telephone, and I knew one man, a man who had come to see me a year and a half before, Henry. And I called Henry and told Henry I wanted to join the Statesboro Group of Alcoholics Anonymous to come around to see me in a few days. He said, I'll be there in five minutes. Because I think they were scared to death I was going to get drunk before I got around to call him. But you see what happened to me? I had a spiritual experience, see, but I hadn't become a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And although I was fully aware of what God, that I needed God in my life and what God could do for me, I had not yet reached the point to where I, I was, I, I could adjust myself to this new relationship. I needed to learn more. I was an infant. I, I, this is the first time I'd ever really had much contact with God that I was conscious of in many, many years anyway. And had I not gone to AA, had not God taken away, and I say God did it because this is a final crucial thing that was done for me that is so vital, so necessary. Had he not done this in a very short time, see, when you're working with God to do something good, often the good will happen. Often it will come to, uh, it will come to pass. And it wouldn't have been long as things began to build up and me not going to AA for you people to keep me straight and keep my thinking straight when I'd have said, thank you, God. Nice having you while I needed you. I won't be needing you anymore, and if I need you, I'll call you again. I would have taken this thing over myself, and I would have drifted, drifted, because, see, I'm a drifter, and I would have done this. But God, in his infinite wisdom, knew me better than I knew myself, and he seized this license. He took it away, and he gave me nothing to do but go to AA, and I started going. When I came down there, I was acquainted with the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I had memorized the steps, and I had worked and discussed them 
but I was not a member. The board told me that I could apply for a reinstatement of my license in six months if I behaved myself. During that six months, I joined Alcoholics Anonymous. I started going to meetings. Very shortly, Dot came in and started going with me. And we went everywhere. We went all over Georgia and South Carolina. We went to a group every night. We played tapes. We, we talked all night. We stuck with this thing. And I began to feel, I began to feel the strength and the power and the love that's here in Alcoholics Anonymous. And in June 1960, when I went before the board, excuse me, in Atlanta, they restored my license without reservation. At that time, I was ready to go back to work. You see, I've discovered it takes five or six meetings for me, just like it did my sponsor. And I go to them. We have an active group there. We have the 12-step group, in, which is branched off, broken off now from the old Statesboro group. We've got two groups there. i got two beds in my office, and I treat these folks in those beds. And i got a, a whole a, a library full of tapes. And a drunk comes in, and I say, do you want to get sober? And he says, yes. And so I put him on the bed. And I start some glucose and vitamins going in his vein where he can't get up. And I put a tape recorder up and I says, now, I'm going to play you something here. <laughs> and I got a lot of tapes. I got old Bob's tape down there and I got Morris's and I got, I got quite a few tapes down there. And I try to pick out something I think this fellow might identify with, although you're you can't do that too good in AA, you know. Sometimes the one you pick out ain't going to be the one he likes, but you do the best you can. And I play this thing, I say, now, if you get tired of this thing, you let me know, and I'll have my nurse cut it off. And they don't often get tired of it, see. And this little coffee room that the 12-step group keeps right there and uh, just uh, adjacent to my office, and they come up and they sit with him and they talk with him, and we have a ball. We have a ball down there. A little fella runs an appliance shop across the street. And he's a member, and he's got a coffee pot. And we sort of stay in competition as who can drink the most coffee out of the other one's pot. There's a hotel down the room, down the street that takes folks in and helps us with them and puts them up. And both the, the boy and the girl that run the hotel, they've both been members of AA. And there's a lawyer across the street. And I, I like him best of all. See, when I took my, I went to, to Lexington, and I thought I needed a psychiatrist. But when I took my inventory, I found out I needed a lawyer. <laughs> 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 So, so Ralph came in very shortly, and now he's down there with me. Many little things have happened that have helped me a great deal. I guess, I guess as you're growing, there, you don't know hardly how you do it. And one little thing happened one night that made me feel pretty good that maybe I was on the right track. Uh, I got through talking, and uh, this stranger came up to me. I thought he was a stranger, but uh, later on he wasn't really. I had known him. I didn't recognize him because I was drunk when I knew him. And he said, you don't recognize me, do you? And I said, no. He said, well, I'm not a member here. I'm a visitor. He said, I come to AA quite often. He said, I'm Dr. So-and-so's psychologist. And uh, he named one of my psychiatrists. that had worked with me a great deal. He said, if you don't recall me, I'm the one that gave you the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Test and the Rorschach Test. And he started naming off all these other things way back several years ago. And he said, I'm, I'm, I'm interested because the things you've said about yourself tonight for the very things we said about you when we took these tests and made this little inventory of ourselves. And this made me feel real good because, and he was very happy about it because they must have really given me hell too because, <laughs> because I was, I was giving myself a bad time that night. But, uh, see, he knew the kind of shape I was in. And, uh, yet, uh, they had all this on paper and they tried to tell me, but I, I couldn't listen. They tried to tell me a lot of things. I was down in Florida one time with a, at a place called Anclote Manor, a nice place if you ever need a psychiatrist. They've got, you can go tarpon fishing there off the gulf, the gulf or just straight across the gulf. And this guy was talking to me, and he said, what do you want? He's a psychiatrist. And I said, well, I want to, I want to be a good doctor. I want to be a good husband. I want to be a good citizen, a good church member. And I named over all these things, and he shook his head. He said, you call yourself a Christian, don't you? I said, sure, I'm a Christian. Belong to the Pittman Park uh, Church. Dues paid up for the rest of the year. And he said, <laughs> he said, do you know how a Christian would answer that question? I said, how? He said, a Christian would say, I want to please God. You know my reaction to that thing was? 
If anybody ever asks me that question again, I'll know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. They asked me up in Lexington today, what do you want? I said, to please God, any fool knows that. <laughs> I think that I think that Velma mentioned something this afternoon that, that really really touched me when she was talking over there. It was a wonderful talk about gratitude. To be grateful for the bad things that happened, and this is what it is. I had to go through a series of stages, I guess, there. I I had to first tolerate these bad things and see that I had to put up with them, and then sort of accept them as a bad part of my life that uh, really was part of it and part of me, and I had to like it. But then finally to be grateful to see the absolute necessity of the bad things that happened to me. The fact that I had to be put away in Lexington. That I had to have this license slipped. That the kind of mind I've got, I could never have had it any other way. And that this was a price for a gift that's worth far, far more than anything that I've ever paid for. What I've gotten from AA, from you people, the love, the support, the strength, life itself. Is so much greater than anything, any price I had to pay that it's, it's a, it can't even be compared. It is a gift, a gift without strings. And I'm grateful for every bit of it that came along. But most of all, I guess, I guess it's love that you've taught me about. That I, I use the word love as if it were, uh, I used to read the second, the, the Corinthian chapter in Corinthians, 13th chapter of 1st Corinthians, and, and talk about it and teach Sunday school classes about it, how good it was and how people should live by it. But I didn't know what love was till I came here. I was down, I was in Atlanta this time, another psychiatrist. And we were talking, and uh, I guess there's somebody here who has had acquaintance with psychiatrists. You've got different kinds. You've got some of the guys that uh, will uh, ask you leading questions and try to draw things out, you know. And you have other psychiatrists who will uh, let you talk, see, and maybe give you some advice along, see, and prompt you. But you got one group of psychiatrists, they call them therapists, and they don't do anything but just sit there and stare. And uh, it's, a, it's a professional accomplishment. <laughs> they go to school to do it, I think. And uh, I know one thing, you cannot stare down a psychiatrist. It can't be done. And this guy was sitting there staring at me, you see, and you could see the whites of his eyes around the iris there. And I was getting fidgety because when you stare at a person long enough and you don't blink the eyes, you, it's, it's, uh, it's disturbing. It was for me. And pretty soon he just leans over and he said, I love you. <laughs> now I'm happily married. I've got a, I've got a nice wife and I don't think that doctors ought to take advantage of the patients. And some of these fellows ought not to be practicing medicine. I got my hat, and I got out of there, and I haven't been back to see him anymore. <laughs> what was this guy trying to do? You folks in AA showed me that scene. What was he trying to do? He was trying to find out what the word love meant to me. Just a neutral statement. I love you. And I say it to the men and the women here all the time, and I love it. He was just trying to find out, and brother, he found out. <laughs> oh, I was sick, sick, sick. Still am, but I'm getting better. I depend on AA. I can't live without it. I don't want to live without it. I hope God never never makes me live without it. Sends me anywhere I can't be with you. Because I depend on you. You're the ones that keep me sober. The grace of God. The grace of God working through people. Got one little story I want to tell you, and I'm through. We got a little girl. AA has been so good to us. It's restored our family. We got a little girl. She's five years old. We had three boys. And now we got the little girl that's come to us since we joined AA. And she's our AA baby, and she's been a wonderful experience. We've enjoyed her. She's been to meetings. She's been to the Southeastern in Birmingham and Louisville. She's been to the Georgia Convention and many others, and she loves AA people. And uh, it's, it's just a wonderful experience. And one, one day, Carolyn is the name, she was going to church. And she's got some character defects. And one of these is she likes to wave at the preacher during the service. And uh, she likes to wave at her friends. She's quite, she's quite an extrovert, and she misbehaves doing church. So we got to where we wouldn't let her go. And this particular day, she was begging her mama to let her go. And finally, uh, Dot said she would have to behave. She said, now, remember now, Carolyn, it's up to you. She says, Mama, no, it's not. She says, the good Lord give me to you. It's up to you. 
And you know, the good Lord give me to you is up to you. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.